Don't you want devoted followers who leave their families for you, give their money to you, give their bodies to you, give up their lives for you, consider you God, and will kill for you? Don't you want to become a cult leader? Hello, and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast where we also veer off the serial killer path to delve into other topics within our beloved true crime community. Side note guys, before I even get started, I got a new puppy. His name is Yukon. You're probably going to hear him in the background chewing and doing puppy things. So I apologize ahead of time if it's really noisy in the background. So this week's podcast will be on the order of the solar temple cult. This cult was founded by two men, Luc Jaure and Joseph DeMambro. So let's get started with them. Joseph DeMambro was born on August 19, 1924, in the commune of Pont Saint Esprit, France. Joseph's father, Raphael DeMambro, was originally from northern Italy and he was a laborer. His mother was Fernand, and she was a French seamstress. Now, Joseph was the oldest of three siblings, having a younger brother, Nicholas, and a younger sister named Florina. By all accounts, his childhood was normal. He attended private Catholic school his entire childhood. He went to mass every single Sunday. He took violin lessons for many years. He was a music lover and was also interested in esoteric writings. He was an above average student with an above average life. But by the time he was 16 years old, World War II had begun. In 1940, he saw the fall of France to German forces, where Germany occupied France until 1944. So after high school, Joseph got a job in a local jewelry store and also learned the art of clockmaking. Then when the liberation of France occurred after the war, inexplicably, his father Raphael just up and vanished, disappeared. Joseph, his siblings, nor his own mother ever knew what happened to him. Joseph married Nanine in March of 1944, and she too was a musician. Together, they had a son they named Bernard, who would actually go on to be a French actor, Bernard de Mambo. But during this time, life was good, predictable. He loved working in the jewelry business in his hometown, but he was still drawn to the occult. And in January of 1956, 32-year-old Joseph joined the ancient and mystical order of the Rosé Crucis or the AMORC. Now the AMORC's website, amorc.org, is translated into quite a few languages. The Rosicrucian Order, according to their website, is a philosophical and educational organization. They are both men and women all around the world that study topics around natural laws. They say, if we can understand the laws of nature better, we can live in harmony with them. Their mission is, quote, to provide seekers with the spiritual wisdom necessary to experience their connectedness with the miraculous world around us and to develop mastery of life." A list of things they study include the mysteries of birth and death, the illusory nature of time and space, awakening the psychic consciousness, the creative power of visualization, development of intuition, psychology, mysticism, metaphysical healing, and so on. You, you get the idea. AMORC claims to be associated with a, quote, perennial philosophy 
most often called the primordial tradition, and they also say their group is the heir and custodian of the, quote, oldest existing traditional fraternity and modern day manifestation of the Rosicrucian fraternity of old, believed by some to originate in the ancient Egyptian mystery schools, unquote. So, yeah, and they are very much still alive and well today and have been for literally hundreds of years. Now, the AMORC enjoyed great successes in France for decades during and after World War II. So Joseph joined in 1956 and by the late 60s, he became the head of the AMORC Lodge in Nîmes, France, and he remained in that position until 1969. He was, at this point, 45 years old. Joseph then left the order to venture out on his own. In 1970, he left his job that he had dedicated his life to to then dedicate his full attention and life to his religion. I could never really find his son Bernard's birthday, but we must assume his son was grown by 1970 because Joseph uprooted himself and traveled all around France, giving lectures about the New Age movement. By 1974, he founded a group called the Organization for Preparation for the New Age. I didn't immediately find a website, which leads me to believe they are no longer together. But basically, the New Age, quotes, was a movement that spread through the occult and metaphysical religious communities in the 70s and the 80s. Followers were looking forward to the new age of love and light through personal transformation and healing. Think of that song, Age of Aquarius. His new group lived communally in Animus, France. But then three years later, he established another communal group, which called themselves La Pyramide in Geneva, Switzerland. Two years after that, they changed their name to the Golden Way Foundation. Daily functions within the group revolved around propagating the group's philosophy, performing esoteric ceremonies, and preparing for the new age. They believed the universe was about to transform and they were preparing their bodies and their spirits for passage into the new world. While in Geneva, Joseph developed as a teacher, and he began to present himself as a representative of the, quote, Great White Brotherhood, unquote. Now, what's that, you're probably asking? Well, my friends, it's a group of people who truly believe they are perfected beings with great power, who are to spread spiritual teachings through selected humans know who else considered himself part of the Great White Brotherhood? Aleister Crowley. Yup, they considered themselves enlightened mystics guiding the spiritual development of the human race. So Joseph also opened a yoga and cultural center for relaxation studio. He began telling people that he was the reincarnation of several very famous ancient people, such as Moses and the Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten. So we will leave off with Joseph here, living in his commune, running his yoga and spiritualism studio, thinking he was up there with Aleister Crowley with his group, the Golden Way Foundation. So our second player in this cult is Luc Jure. Luc Jure was born on October 18, 1947 in the Belgian Congo, which was located in Central Africa until its independence in 1960. Luke wasn't actually in Africa long, his parents having moved back to their homeland in Belgium in the early 1950s. 
there really isn't much information on his childhood at all. An older brother described him as sociable, intelligent, and athletic, that he loved sports and life was a competition. Once he was done with primary and high school, he went to the University of Brussels and received a medical degree in 1974. That level of schooling isn't easy, so we can assume that he was actually highly intelligent. But while in college, he did join the Walloon Communist Youth, which basically assured him being under surveillance. However, two years after his medical school graduation, he joined the Belgian army and became a paratrooper, participating in the Battle of Calwezi. This battle saw France and Belgian forces working together to liberate hostages from a particular city. But once he was out of the military, he began to formally study homeopathy. Now, a homeopath, for those that might not know, is a pseudoscientific system of alternative medicine. Homeopaths believe that a substance that causes symptoms of a disease in a healthy person could cure similar symptoms in sick people, like cures like, big air quotes there, like cures like. All relevant scientific knowledge about physics and chemistry, biochemistry and biology gained since the mid 19th century confirms that homeopathic remedies have no active content and have no effect on any known disease. But Luke was into it. Somehow he was able to qualify as a homeopathic practitioner in France. Luke began to travel rather extensively, studying various forms of alternate and spiritual healing. His travels took him to the Philippines in 1977, where he studied psychic healing, and he also traveled to China, Peru, and India. So in the very early 80s, Luke decided to settle down in Animas, France, not far from the Swiss border, and practice homeopathy there, having seen patients from France and Switzerland. And he had gathered a loyal following in France, Switzerland, as well as Canada. The following loved his teachings and his beliefs. He married a woman named Christine, and they did have a child, but unfortunately the infant did pass away, and after that, the marriage crumbled. Luke traveled short distances to lecture on holistic health as well as all things paranormal, and he invited anyone who was interested into the Amenta Club. Now, this club served as a host to his paid lectures on topics like medicine and conscious as well as love and biology. Sounds fine to me. So some of the groups he lectured for was the Golden Way Foundation in Geneva, Switzerland. Now remember, this is where Joseph de Mambro and Luc Jaure met around 1981. By this point, Joseph de Mambro had affiliated himself with the Renewed Order of the Temple, which was an occult founded by a man named Julian in the 70s. Now, Julian had served four years in jail for his wartime activities as a Nazi collaborator and was reported to have relations with neo-Nazi and white supremacist groups. So there's a little bit more to all of that and basically to make a very long kind of twisty and turny story short, three separate but similar sects, the Renewed Order of the Temple, the Sovereign Order of the Solar Temple, and Joseph's Golden Way Foundation, members all kind of converged into one during a mystical ceremony in Geneva. By 1984, they were collectively the Order of the Solar Temple. A mystical and elitist group, 
the Order of the Solar Temple claimed to be the heirs of the medieval Knights Templar who guarded the Holy Grail. For those not familiar with the Knights Templar, they were basically a Catholic military order founded in 1119 and headquartered on the Temple Mount or Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem. They went to the Vatican and were recognized by the Pope. They became a favored charity and grew amazingly fast. Templar Knights, in their distinctive white robes with a red cross, were at that time some of the most skilled fighting units of the Crusades. When the Holy Land was lost, the support for the Templars faded. Now the Knights Templar are included in so very many conspiracy theories that I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole for this podcast. The Order of the Solar Temple drew their authority in part by an appeal to a lineage of Grand Masters that were claimed to have gone back to the medieval order of the temple that had been suppressed at the beginning of the 14th century. They combined New Age beliefs with occultism and Masonic rituals. Joseph began to claim that he was the reincarnation of Moses from the Christian Bible and that it was his personal mission to guide humanity to enlightenment. Also at this time, he fathered a daughter with one of his followers that he named Emmanuel. He was, you know, around 60 years old when his daughter was conceived. Joseph saw his daughter as a, quote, cosmic being who would lead in the coming new age, unquote. Their group attracted successful upper middle class and rich members who were, you know, already disillusioned with the conventional churches, but still wanting that spiritual life. Joseph and Luke attracted nearly 1,000 members in Switzerland, Canada, and France. Joseph took it upon himself to take their followers and choose mates for them. He encouraged them to have, quote, special children who would assist his own daughter in her new age task. He would then interchange these couples, switch them around, and then encourage more children. One of the rituals was to, quote, call upon the great white brotherhood to release the energy through the world that would ring the awaited change, unquote. Now, Luke acted more as a teacher, the front man. He held courses and seminars for recruitment, letting people know how much it would cost to be a member of the temple. And guys, it wasn't cheap. Luke and Joseph led their, quote, cult, not as a team, but autocratically, meaning they took no account of the other's wishes or opinions, and they did try to dominate the order. Members had access to special publications and ornate, fancy initiations that were filmed, but the faces were blurred. Joseph began presenting himself to the members as being an actual representative of higher beings and the receiver and transmitter of divine messages, which he would, of course, receive during group ceremonies. They preached that Jesus was a solar God King. Some of the teachings were directly inspired by Aleister Crowley, who headed yet another temple group in the early 1900s. So Joseph and Luke told their followers that they wanted to build health centers in Europe as well as Canada and prompted even more money coming in from the members. Under Luke and Joseph was a leadership council of 33 members, I know guys, I know, known as the Elder Brothers of the Rosy Cross. And then there were regional lodges set up to perform their intricate initiation ceremonies. The lodges had altars, intricate rituals were performed, and everyone had elaborate costumes. They began talking about the imminent end of the world. 
They taught that the earth was getting ready to face this worldwide catastrophe in the mid 90s. So in anticipation and preparation of this cataclysmic event, members were told and they began to believe that it would be necessary to enter a higher spiritual plane. Luke and Joseph bought a larger cottage like 50 miles north of Montreal, Canada and took a handful of very loyal followers with them. This now served as the headquarters. They then opened an organic farm that is still in operation and that's great. But then in 1993, Luke and another follower were arrested and charged with possession of illegal weapons. Luke pled guilty and only had to pay a thousand dollar fine, but at that point his reputation was ruined. The Canadian police suspected he was part of a much worse situation and they began to question the Swiss police about him. What they didn't know was that Joseph was also operating an arms trafficking ring that included money laundering through Swiss banks. So after all the legal trouble, Luke returned to Europe and the Canadian followers would often fly back and forth to visit him. But Luke and Joseph were already becoming disillusioned with the negative attention their group was getting. Some members in the early 90s began leaving, saying that this new age wasn't happening like they had been told that it would. And in a panic, the leaders ordered the drinks of members to be drugged, then have those people sign papers they wouldn't have signed otherwise to try to force people to stay. Most importantly, they didn't want the nearly two-thirds of the group population that was women to leave. Ex-cult members said that Luke would yell at people these weird random things like wash the lettuce seven times before eating, you know, and other crazy things that his followers would obey like machines. But leave people did and some filed lawsuits against the order claiming that they were a cult. At the same time, Joseph's health began to fade. You know, he was an old man by now suffering from kidney failure, diabetes, and he had been diagnosed with cancer. And his, quote, chosen one daughter rebelled against the weight of what her father prophesied her to be, and she became, quote, unmanageable. You see, she had witnessed her father's staged spiritual visions and that the divine beings and messages received from said beings were actually produced by special effects and holograms and she shared her knowledge with other followers of the cult. This in a roundabout way led to authorities tapping into the phone lines of prominent members and investigating threats called into them. People who were once inside fled the group stating they used mind control to subjugate members. In 1993, Luke, Joseph, and several members traveled to Australia, upset at the refusal of the public to evolve and bring in the new age. They were also becoming increasingly paranoid about the world around them. They put together a set of documents that would later be mailed out in 1994 detailing their rationale for their final act in which they would escape the world into a higher dimension. They felt they had been rejected by the whole world. Here's a quote from one member, quote, we are rejected by the world, first by the people. The people can no longer withstand us and our earth. Unfortunately, she rejects us. How would we leave otherwise? We also reject this planet. We wait for the day we can leave. Life for me is intolerable, intolerable. I can't go on. 
So think about the dynamic that will get us to go elsewhere, unquote. Again, a lot of this is translated from French into English. Okay, so Joseph himself wrote, quote, We don't know when they might close the trap on us a few days, a few weeks. We are being followed and spied upon in our every move. All the cars are equipped with tracing and listening devices. All of their most sophisticated techniques are being used on us. While in the house, beware of surveillance cameras, lasers, and infrared. Our file is the hottest on the planet, the most important of the last 10 years, if not of the century. However that may be, as it turns out, the concentration of hate against us will give us enough energy to leave." Unquote. So they decided that it was time for a quote, voluntary departure to another planet in order to create a new world. Joseph decided it was a passage across a mirror or travel in a spaceship. But in order to be able to do that, they must return to the father. Most interpreted it as a change in consciousness, but some knew he and Luke meant a transfer to another universe entirely. The remaining members were told to stay on 24 hour alert. But then, inconvenient for these guys, Waco happened. There was a cassette taped conversation between Joseph and Luke and it was recorded where both men were heard saying this. Joseph, people have beaten us to the punch, you know. Luke, well, yeah, Waco beat us to the punch. Joseph, in my opinion, we should have gone six months before them. What we'll do will be even more spectacular. Nice conversation. So in October of 1994, over the course of a few days, a three-month-old baby whom Luke and Joseph thought was the Antichrist, was stabbed repeatedly and killed with a wooden stake. Then more than 55 people died in three separate countries, some by bullet wound, others by ingesting tranquilizers or suffocation through smothering, including Luke and Joseph, whose group's bodies were arranged in this circular pattern. Several children were amongst the bodies, charred from the fires that were set after the people were dead. The duo and 11 of their senior disciples did have a last supper at a local restaurant beforehand in Switzerland. Some of the surviving members were sort of convinced that the people who had committed quote, mass suicide, were actually murdered by watching governments or something of that nature. They say they do not believe the members would have killed themselves, but make no mistake, a few years later, similar mass suicides happened in Canada and France again, all related to the Order of the Solar Temple. So, like other cults that we have studied, it started out innocently enough people gathering together looking for something more meaningful than the Sunday school that they went to as children, wanting to believe in something a bit more tangible than biblical floods and so on. There's nothing wrong with that. But aliens and cosmic beings during the new age, you know, connections with Aleister Crowley and an infant murdered because he's supposedly the Antichrist. I am amazed nearly daily at the things people actually choose to believe, but I know others think the same about me. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. And I apologize again for the background noise of the puppy.